Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome with me David Ono. Hi, everybody. I was, I was looking for the mouse. I'm, the, oh, I'm horrible when it comes to tech stuff. Uh, I'm definitely a dinosaur in this industry. The mouse is here, right? Oh, it's in the shelf. Okay. It's right here. There we go. All right. So smooth start so far, right? I just want to make sure I get everything uh, set up before I get to talking because, uh, uh, you know, I didn't want to break the momentum, but how are you? Thank you very much for having me here today. And I, I've spoken to the school before. You guys are great. I love this, this university, and I hope you do too. I hope you really appreciate all that you're getting from this place, because it really is a wonderful institution. Um, Professor Franco brings a, a, a group by the studio quite often, and uh, I think she's got a group coming next week. So um, we'd love to see you, have you come into the studio, be bored to tears while you watch the four o'clock edition of Eyewitness News from our studio, and you'll see really how, how quiet it is, and there's really no conversation whatsoever, except on, during the, the commercial breaks. But I, I love talking to people in the position that you're in, because you are basically um, filled with energy and ambition, and hopefully a good deal of knowledge. Uh, and, and I love to, to give you or let you know what, what I went through in my part, uh, in my early years of my career, uh, because the simplest things make such a huge difference. And right off the bat, what I'll tell you is the most important thing you could do is get an internship. When I was uh, in school, uh, I think it was my junior year, and it was required that we do an internship uh, either, you know, at some, some kind of journalistic entity. So I went to school at University of North Texas, that's up near in the Dallas, Texas area. And I interned at the NBC affiliate. And I, I, at the time, I just thought, okay, it's, you know, I, I just have to do this. And I, it was like an hour's drive to get there for me, and it was really, it was, it was a bit challenging. However, once I got there and I walked into that newsroom and I saw the energy and you heard the police scanners and you see people running around and, and you know, uh, breaking news all over and trying to cover the news. It was, it was a, a fascinating experience for me, and I thought, I like this environment. This is pretty neat. And then the most remarkable thing, yet at the time I had no idea it was remarkable, but the supervisor of the interns, about a month after I was there, said, um, we have a minimum wage job that we think you might be good for. And the job she had was... Um, Call, it was Chiron, I don't know, the character generator, that's what they called it back then. It was the, the computer that pops people's names up when they're talking on television and stuff like that. So they said, we have this job, we think you could do it, it's, it's 3.35 an hour, which was the minimum wage at the time. Okay, don't laugh, because I granted it, yes, I'm old. All right, so I didn't realize how important that was until several months later when the other interns that came into the station with me left, and their internship was done. But, but I had to stay there because I had a job there. And so I worked there while I finished up my school, and I did this Chiron thing, which was very simple. But from there, I then learned to be on the assignment desk, which meant I just listened to police scanners, and I listened for fires and shootings and stuff like that. And when I heard something, I would tell somebody. And then from there, I became a writer, and then an associate producer, and then a producer. And then I ended up producing the weekend news over there uh, for a couple of years. And I would see these anchors come in, and, and they would, I would basically write the whole show. And these anchors would come in with their fancy cars and answering their fan mail, because people still dealt a lot with mail then. There was no such thing as the internet. And I thought, I could do that. I really think I could do that. So I put together a resume tape. At the end of one of my shows, I just sat on the set, brought a suit, I read the scripts that I had written, and I looked in Broadcast Magazine, again, because there's no internet, and I looked in the back of the magazine, and they have a, a wanted part of the magazine, and I looked for whatever was open in Texas. And, I, and they had an opening in Midland, Odessa, Texas, for an evening anchor. So I sent my tape out there, and they hired me. 
not because I was any good at all, but because I had large market newsroom experience. I knew how to produce my own show. I could write my own show. And they wanted that. And then the rest I could learn on the job. So that's what got me on the air. And that was back in 1987. So I look back at that and I think, if I didn't get that minimum wage job doing Chiron, if I didn't do that internship, I never would have had my foot in the door. Because all the other interns that were with me in that class never got a job in the industry. They all got eliminated. The industry is exceptionally competitive. It's you know a lot like you, you hear about sports, you hear about acting, uh, other entertainment stuff, and and this getting getting your job, your first job, is a really difficult chore. It's a difficult task. So I want to make sure that you understand that while you're still in school and you have that opportunity to get some experience inside a newsroom uh, and do your very best once you're in there to make an impression, to get that whatever job it is. It doesn't matter what the job is. I'm the perfect example of that. Don't sit and wait for your first job to be an anchor or a reporter. Take any job. We have what we call apprentice jobs, but basically all they do is answer phones and run scripts to us in the set. That's it. But those people are all getting jobs. We in just fact had a uh, a half a dozen of them within the last two months get their first job within newsrooms as anchors, reporters, producers. But they got that job because of the, the uh, experience they got within our newsroom. And it all started from that internship. There's no better way to do it. If you find yourself out of school, without a job, the longer that time goes without you getting that job, the more difficult it becomes. It doesn't mean you won't do it. But you're going to have to be innovative. You're going to have to be ready to really fight for that first job. If your foot's already in the door, it's going to be that much easier. OK, point made. Do you all understand that? That's a good one, right? Um, with that said, the industry has changed tremendously. When I first got in uh, television, you know, cable news was still relatively young. Uh, people weren't really watching it. They were still watching the big three, ABC, CBS, NBC, so TV had this huge market share. Lots and lots of people watched television back then. Uh, less on cable, internet wasn't there. This industry is evolving quickly because there are so many different places for you to find information that are gonna grab your attention away. You know, there's the HBOs, the sports channels, et cetera, that are taking our audience away from news. So that's why news is constantly looking for people who are energetic, who are young, who are innovative. This whole social media thing right now, vitally important. And I've already established the fact that I am a dinosaur. I'm, I'm an old timer. So these things to me come difficult. I know they're real, you're probably really good at Facebook, Twitter. Does everybody here have a Twitter account? Some people say no, some people say yes, okay. My managers are angry with me because I am so old school that I was hesitant to do Facebook and I didn't want to do Twitter. I didn't want to do any of them. They started a Facebook account and a Twitter account and I didn't touch them for two years. So finally, um, a couple of months ago, my, my, my boss came to me and she said, you really need to do this, this stuff. And they gave me a whole dissertation of how young people like yourself, you share information via this social media more so than you do so by just watching television. And so if we want to reach the younger audience, this is the way to do it. So I'm slowly learning how to do this Facebook thing. The Twitter thing, even more difficult for me. Uh, the, about three weeks ago, my, my boss calls me and she says, you need to concentrate on Twitter. And I'm like, I've been, I've been doing Facebook. <laughs> she says, no, Twitter. Twitter is where it's at. And she says, David, do you realize we started this Twitter account and you have 700 followers? I'm like, my God, that's a lot. <laughs> and she said, no, George has 74,000. <laughs> so I, you know, in perspective, I'm like, okay, 700 is probably pretty disappointing if you have a job in the position that I'm in and that's it. So I've been trying to tweet. I still don't know how to attach a photo or a story. <laughs> I just do words. I don't know hashtags, I don't know anything. <laughs> I don't know what any of that means. But I type stuff up and then we have people in a social media department who guide me. 
So if you could do me a favor, find me on Facebook, find me on Twitter. If you could pump my numbers up, I can go to my manager and say, look, I'm really working hard at this. That would, <laughs> that would be very helpful for me. Look, I want to make sure that I leave enough time for questions uh, for you guys. So I'm, I'm kind of getting into uh, my presentation here. And, and I'm the four and e 6 o'clock evening news anchor at uh, ABC7 Eyewitness News. And we are, um, boy, can I say this without sounding like a, uh, we are a market leader. But it is truly one of the best stations, not just in the market, in, in the country. And as a result, I'm exceptionally lucky to be working at this station. Uh, not only because we, we draw a large audience, we're, we're very stable. We ha I've had the same bosses for the entire 17 years I've been here at this station, which is unheard of. The average lifespan for a news director within our industry is two years. My boss has been there for 19 years, and 17 of which has been with me. And I'm, and I'm very happy to have that. So I've been able to establish a really quality relationship with my bosses who trust me and who allow me to see history. They send me all over the world to witness things. And that's a rare thing when it comes to local news. And I know if you guys want to get into television, that's what you ultimately envision, right? You want to be able to see the world. You want to be able to report on history. You want to do it at a very high level. And luckily, I'm generally able to do that. Um, and I'm very, very happy to be able to do that. Uh, so what I did today, I, I got three pieces uh, that I've done in the last year and a half or so. And I just want to give you an example of, of what we have been doing and what, what my job generally is. And it, my main job, obviously, is to sit on the anchor set and to talk to you and to tell you what's happening. If there's breaking news, I need to be there. I need to tell you where the fire's going, where the flood's going, when the storm's coming in, whatever it might be. But in, in addition to that, I'm occasionally allowed to go and report on things that I feel tell a great story, are important. And sometimes it's not considered breaking news or hard news. It's just interesting. It's uh, historic. So this first piece um, we ran last year, last summer. Uh, last year it was the 40th anniversary of the Napalm Girl photo. And do you guys, I, almost everybody has seen this photo. It was taken in Vietnam in 1972. It's a naked girl, nine years old, running down the street. She's terribly burned. Um, her village just got hit with napalm by her own people. And Nick Ut was the photographer for the Associated Press. Nick works in Los Angeles now. He is from Vietnam. He grew up in Vietnam. He was a, a wonderful photographer for the Associated Press in Vietnam. But then when Saigon fell in 75, he flew to LA and he's been working here for the Associated Press ever since. Nick and I have become friends. And one day he came to me several years ago and he said, David, we need to work on a story together. Although he does it with his very thick Vietnamese accent, which you basically need a translator for. You really can't understand him, which you'll see in this piece. But I said, Nick, let's do your story. Your anniversary is coming up. Take me to, to this village where this happened and, and walk me through this whole event. Everybody knows the photo. Nobody knows how that photo was taken, the circumstances that are behind it, and what happened afterwards with Kim Phuc, the little girl. So that's what we did. Last year, for the 40th anniversary of this photograph, we went to Vietnam, and Nick and one other reporter walked me through their experience in that village. This actually was a documentary that we did. This is just the very first segment of that documentary. So hopefully everything goes well, and I'll hit play. What is it about a photograph that draws us in? A frozen moment that allows us to immerse ourselves in that split second. We can study it, live it, feel it. A split second where everything comes to a halt. This photograph, taken June 8, 1972, won the Pulitzer Prize, but its impact is immeasurable. You know, I shock. I say, I, that's why I say I want to help her. I want to help her that day. Los Angeles Associated Press photographer Nick Oot took that picture. He's been working in L.A. for more than three decades, but he is from Vietnam. Forty years ago, 
He was standing on Highway 1 outside of a small village called Trang Bang and snapped that photo of a nine-year-old girl named Kim Fook. Her clothes burned off her body by napalm. To mark this 40th anniversary, I accompany Oot back to Trang Bang. Like every other newsroom, we're saying, where is the girl? We are joined by Christopher Wayne, a former British TV reporter who also was there that day. While Nick photographed the incident for print, Wayne's crew captured it on film for television. Innocent victims have always been a part of war, but never before had such a vivid example been captured. What happened that day to that small village has happened a thousand times before in the war. But this time, there was somebody there to shoot it and show the world. This will be Wayne's first time back since that day. You see the calculator that wouldn't move. The reunited journalists noticed so much has changed. So where were you when the napalm actually went? I was down right here on the highway, down right here. Gee. But walking through the village, memories come back to them in vivid detail. And so he came in from there yeah. and just overshot. And the two slowly pieced together the events that unfolded that day. The North Vietnamese troops were trying to take control of the town. South Vietnamese were defending, and the villagers were caught in the middle. The temple, the focal point of the incident, is still here. This is where the nightmare began. Kim Phuc and her family, as well as other villagers, were inside the temple thinking they were safe. But then the Vietnamese bombers started moving in, dropping their bombs. In fact, you could see on the film the explosions going on all around the building. And that set off a panic. Villagers started thinking the temple was being targeted. So they ran out those doors through this gate right here and kept running in that direction down Highway 1. We could see them pouring out of the temple and running towards us. And that was when the second plane came in and it dropped these four canisters of napalm straight across them. Four canisters of napalm hit right here, hitting deep into the bushes right over there and rolling in this direction, covering the road into the trees over here. This entire area was engulfed in flames. And the effect was like somebody opening an oven door. We were a good 400 yards away and we felt this heat. And uh, it, was, it was one of the worst things I've ever seen. Out of the smoke, a horrific scene unfolds. Villagers running in terror. Two women carrying babies appear, desperate for help. There was none. Both children are terribly burned. One appears to have charred clothes hanging off its body, but that is actually skin. Neither child survives. Two minutes would go by, and then Nick would spot the silhouette of a young girl. Then I look at black smoke, I saw, foot I saw, Little Kim Pook naked. I don't know her name that time, but her arm like this. I keep shooting, shooting a picture of Kim running. The thing I always remember was that they, they were absolutely silent. There was no sound from them until they saw us. When they saw us, then they started to cry and shout. But until that point, they were, I suppose, in shock. Then when she passed my camera, I saw her body burn so badly. Say, Oh my God, I don't want no more pictures. She screaming, crying, I see, I say, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm dying. And I uh, need some water, need water. I run with water her body. I want to help her. I said, no more pictures, I want to help Kim Phuc right away. Even though the South Vietnamese Army dropped the bombs on their own villagers, it made no effort to help the injured. Journalists were all that was left who could help. So I gave her a drink of water. If you want to, recognize me, then look at the watch. I, I always wear my watch on the inside, and you'll see, see that. In this photo, Chris can be seen kneeling in front of Kim, doing what he can to help, while other members of the media look on in disbelief. Nick would then drive her to the hospital. It would be an agonizingly long and difficult trip, but they made it. He gets Kim admitted to the hospital. Nick is overjoyed. Then I'm so happy I live in the hospital. And in the van, I had to pray, my brother, keep him good luck, good luck. Nick's brother, Mi Thon Hyun, was his idol, his mentor. Nick called him Bai, which means seven. Mi was the seventh born. Before the war, Bai was a Vietnamese movie star who quit acting to become a photographer for the Associated Press. Bai was always searching for that magic picture that would turn the world against the war and stop the killing. He was talented and brave, perhaps to a fault. 
In 1965, he was shot in the Mekong Delta, and while receiving aid in a field hospital, it was overrun by the Viet Cong. Bai was executed. Everyone show up to my brother's funeral. This is Nick at his brother's funeral, only 14 years old. I cry a lot after that. He loved me so much. I love him too, my brother. He always take care of me, and he he want he asked me he want to become a photographer. Nick went to his brother's boss looking for work. They gave him a job in the dark room. He constantly studied the pictures coming in, learning the craft, eventually becoming a combat photographer just like his brother. So that's why Nick, after leaving the hospital, began to pray to his brother. I didn't pray to that, I prayed to my brother. I said, my brother, please. I remember you tell me to stop this war. I want a picture, maybe this one, maybe stop this war. When he developed his film, he couldn't believe what he found. And I look for negative, number seven. Number seven, his brother's name. That now famous picture was the seventh on the roll. Nick says it was Bailly speaking to him. I cried, I said, oh my God, that's my brother, name number. Unbelievable. You can see look in the picture right now, that's number seven. The photo would be printed in newspapers and magazines around the world, having an enormous impact. Take it, take it back to war. Creating a firestorm of outrage over Vietnam a picture that would force the rest of the world to finally see the innocent victims of war. Victims who now have a face. For Nick, it meant the Pulitzer Prize. For history, it meant one of the most iconic and powerful images of the 20th century. So that's, thanks. The, um, the rest of the documentary, uh, I actually bring in Kim Fook. She did her first television interview since the 1980s with us, thanks to, to Nick talking her into it. And she's a wonderful person, so that's what you'll see later on in that documentary. Uh, but I, I thought that was a, a great opportunity to bring a story that, peop that had kind of fallen off the radar. Nobody was really thinking about that photograph on its 40th anniversary or the importance of that photograph. So I thought this might be a real great opportunity to, to find something out there that nobody's thinking about that ends up being a really good story. Uh, and I, I think the, the bottom line to that lesson is um, follow your instincts. And if you generally find something really fascinating, more than likely, once you're a reporter, your audience will as well. Um, the next piece I have for you is um, Haiti. When the Haiti earthquake struck, it was really one of the most horrible things you can imagine. I, I've, been, I've covered many, many disasters, uh, from Katrina to, uh, obviously, to Haiti, to Japan, to, you know, what have you. But Haiti was, was really highly unusual because the country was a mess to begin with. It's, it's in terrible disarray. But these buildings were so poorly constructed that when the ground shook, uh, and they all collapsed, so many people died. There were 300,000 people dead in that city. And so when we got there, right, right uh, within hours of it happening, it was um, remarkable. There were bodies everywhere. But, you know, we got through all of that, but I, I decided that I wanted to go back six months later because one of the things that had developed in Haiti was these horrible tent cities. Uh, people were thrown in these 10 cities because there's no place to live. And already Haiti was, was as I said, um, had, it was impoverished, they had no food, they had very bad water. And I think one of the keys to this is, uh, Haiti is all the, the attention that they got, still, they have not gotten out of, of this situation. There's still hundreds of thousands of people stuck in these 10 cities. So we flew back to rediscover Haiti, six, I think we did this story six months after the initial earthquake to see if there's been any recovery at all. And ironically, the biggest tent city that they have sits right across the street from their palace, uh, which was also in shambles. And so this is my experience in Haiti uh, and what I found in that uh, tent city. I think this is, yeah, it's moving. 
Eyewitness News returns to Haiti six months after a 7.0 earthquake left the already impoverished nation in ruins. Nearly 300,000 people were killed. Recovery seems at a near standstill. So what has changed in six months? Our colleague David Ono is here with a closer look. Michelle, Mark, the level of misery is what has changed and not for the better. The vast majority of people in Port-au-Prince, one and a half million, are now living in tents or less. Their health is suffering, their spirits are breaking. And tonight I take you to a tent city directly across the street from the presidential palace. That palace is now collapsed with no sign of new life. It's a fitting symbol of a country whose government has been completely inadequate at helping its people. Surveillance video from inside the presidential palace captured the moment the earthquake struck. The once grand building collapsing, its powerful walls simply a facade. Today the country has done very little to rebuild the symbol of its government, the perfect metaphor for Haiti itself. Right behind me you see that iconic scene of the presidential palace that has collapsed in the earthquake and ironically, if you could just go directly across the street, you'll run into one of the biggest tent cities in all of Port-au-Prince. Thousands of people in here struggling just to stay alive. It's really terrible. Franz Abelard is one of those people. He is seething with anger and for good reason. The house is like broken down. I lost those two kids. I lost three kids all together. That's your son? That's my son. That's my daughter. And I lost my wife too, right? His three kids, his wife, his home, his job all lost in the earthquake. He shows me photos of happier times and then shows me what his life is today. Look at the, the way I leave, right? It's terrible. But right now I don't have nothing, zip, zero. This dilapidated tent has been his home since January. What's it like to live in, in this kind of community? What, what's it like? Oh, it sucks. For me, like, it's really terrible. If you're going right there, you're going to see, like, how, how, how they're living, how the, 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 the water is so dirty. How this terrible. So we go. I get a personal tour. With the palace on the horizon, we travel deeper into this horrid maze of shanty homes. Look at that. They have a little child taking shower up in there. So if you they, come in here and check right there, yeah, they, 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 they're taking shower up in there. It was shocking to see this putrid green cesspool. The good news is, it's not what they drink or cook with. This is. It's trucked in by the Haitian government, but it's contaminated. The signs are everywhere, especially in the children. This woman shows me her seven-month-old child. Look at her skin. Drinking the water does this. Her hair is falling out. See, you can't tell from the hair. The kid is like, he's, you don't, like, he's sick. Bloated and malnourished. That is their bed. This is their home. She shows me what she does when it rains. She simply holds her child and stands here. This teenage mother shows us her 16-month-old daughter also struggling with a terrible skin condition. Since ten, uh, like two months ago, the skin is come, like, coming like that. This 17-year-old admits she has resorted to prostitution to feed her child. She says her dream is to have a house, food, and a job. I'm standing in a small clearing in the middle of this enormous tent city, and the one thing you don't get on the video that you feel in real life is the fact that these tents are everywhere, and they cut off all the air from circulating. And so on a sweltering day, like almost every day here in Port-au-Prince, living here with no breeze is absolutely unbearable. Misery is the common denominator. Abelard walks me to a tent that makes his blood boil. Inside, a mentally handicapped child, catatonic, nude, lying on plastic. The government don't even have them out. A children like that, a kids like that should have a care. All these refugees tell me outside of the water they have not seen any help from the government in months. No food, no money, nothing. Abelard has a very strong opinion as to why. Stop giving the government the, like, money, because what they do, they take the money, try to blame it on American people. Mm -hmm. That means, like, you don't, like, you look like you never did nothing. Mm -hmm. And truth, truthfully, I know you're doing a lot. So you think Americans are giving money to your government, but the government's not helping you guys with the money, they're keeping the money? Correct, that's exactly. And it does beg the question, where is all that aid that is supposed to be getting to these helpless people? We did... I'm going to go forward because we're, we're running out of time and I, I really want you to see our next story.
I went to Japan, and, and there was a similar thing. I, uh, right, I got there right after the earthquake, but we were basically handcuffed after that earthquake and tsunami. Th that country was at a standstill. You couldn't travel. There was no gasoline. Uh, roads were washed out. So I did most of my reports out of Tokyo, which really stunk because I didn't get to see the damage. And then when I was, the day I was leaving to the northern part of the country to see the damage from the tsunami, everybody was told to get out. They, they got us all out because they were very concerned that Fukushima was going to go. Uh, there were reports that there were huge nuclear uh, clouds heading towards Tokyo, that it could potentially explode. So they got us all on planes and they flew us out of there, which I thought was very, not what we were there for. But out of an abundance of caution, all the networks did it. So I went back on the one year anniversary. And the advantage to going back to these disasters a year later is you really grab the stories. You're able to uh, hear from people who can reflect then, calmly reflect on what they went through and what these communities went through. This particular story is a gentleman that I had met in this small town of Ofenato who is a baker. He has a bakery. However, he's also an amateur photographer, and he got some amazing, never-before-seen video of the tsunami coming in and washing out his town. So I decided, I also did a documentary here, but this is one segment from that documentary that I felt was very telling on what a tsunami can do. He looks out of what was his office window. His view, once a bustling seaport, now a barren wasteland. He can't help but still feel the pain and anger. This building was once Kenji Saito's bakery. I met him here on a very cold day in the small fishing town of Ofunato. That's where the tsunami came from? Saito's story is invaluable, not just because of his experience, but because he captured the whole disaster on video. And he walks me through every moment, beginning with the earthquake. So he says that he was standing in this room when the earthquake struck and, and it started shaking. So he pulled out his iPhone and he started to shoot his video. That's how it started. The ground shaking, the building shaking. So he started shooting around his office, walked over here out of his office and you'll see it on the videotape. And he goes, starts going through his office building telling people to evacuate. And you can see the people that are scared and frightened. You can see people in the doorways over here standing there trying to keep their balance. And he walked in this direction, showing us this is where he went when he shot the videotape, down the stairs. He's moving quickly now, continuing to shoot. This is the direction he went, fast. So, and imagine, the building is shaking the whole time. This quake rattled this place for about three solid minutes. Comes out over here in this direction. So here, you will recognize this. This is when he turns the camera, and you see all the fish jumping. That's a fascinating part of the videotape. And he continues to move in this direction. Saito knew a tsunami was coming. So once his building was evacuated, he grabbed another camera and he ran to a hill just a block away. It was the very hill he ran to when he was 12 years old in 1960, narrowly escaping a tsunami that killed thousands. It has now saved his life twice. <laughs> From that hill, he says he stood on the edge of disaster and watched. In the beginning, it is uncomfortably calm. Even the tsunami alarm lacks urgency. But then, keep your eye on the cars in the distant parking lot. The water slowly at first starts to rise. And then more quickly, as the cars start washing away, the inner sea wall, meant to protect this community from tsunami, is dry right now. A giant barge breaks free. But now look at the sea wall. Water begins to pour into the community. A soda machine washes away. And then the inevitable begins to reveal itself. A building breaks free and washes down the street. Amid the crackling lumber and steel, the sound of Saito crying at what he's witnessing. Ah. 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 
ティだよ。おや。何が膨張ティだよ。In just seven minutes, it's gone. Seven minutes from this to this. Saito's video is a stunning education of the merciless power of a tsunami. Today, there is very little left. A broken clock stopped precisely when the tsunami hit. A mangled seawall. A few gutted buildings, and residents who have lost loved ones, homes, jobs, their lives. So I think, as you watch these these stories, obviously it's more than just going there and shooting video and putting it on TV.、Uh, I have a, a wonderful editor who does. I mean, he's, he does great things. Your generation needs to be able to do that. You need to be able to shoot, write, edit. When I was a kid, your age,、um, I didn't have to do as much as you're required to do now. With today's technology, you can buy an edit system and take it home and, and do it at home. That, that was an impossibility when I was your age. So in a way, you have an advantage there, but you have a disadvantage when it comes to working because you're going to be expected to know how to do that. You're going to be expected to know what good shooting is, what good editing is. Plus, you have to be able to write and deliver. So keep all that in mind. Hone your skills and be expected to do everything because that's what's expected of you. Okay. I'm sorry it took so much time. I think do we have a few minutes for questions? Is that okay?、Uh, there's a gentleman that's going to be walking around with a microphone. I don't know if anybody. Has any questions? You might want to just get to lunch. But、uh, anybody out there have a question? Yes, sir. How do I get my sources? Oh, okay. Every every story is different, and it's always good to make contacts with people who have contacts in that country. So, for example, the Saito guy who had this crazy video. I have contacts in Little Tokyo here in in Japan. All right. Los Angeles, <laughs> and、um, they said, you know, I talked、uh, this. I did the story on this one woman who actually survived the tsunami from L.A., and she was there. She's from Japan gen- initially, so she, in talking to her about her story, she said, "And I'm from this small town, Ofunato. It really got hit hard. And a friend of mine has this video, and I'm like, really? So if I go there, can you introduce me to him? And she did. And then I saw the video, and it was amazing." And then that's that's it. It was that simple. But yeah, contacts are really obviously key to finding a great story. Just like Nick Oot in the、uh, the Napalm Girl story. Nick was a friend of mine, but he ended up being a great contact to get a hold of Kim Fook.、Um, any any other questions? Yes, Mia. You could yell if you want. You've, you've emphasized how important obtaining an internship is, but、um, how important is prior experience? Well, prior experience、uh, obviously is 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 very important.、Um, I would say most important, but you can't really get prior experience usually if you're just a student. It's it's the old thing. They would love to have for you to have experience, but how do you get experience without the job? But if you can get experience in some degree, and there, I know there are smaller entities, there are smaller cable TV stations,、uh, there's small newspapers, etc. Those are all great options for you. If you can get in there, that's obviously even better than an internship. So you want to do that, and plus you're able to put stuff on the air, make your tape better, your resume better, and that, that'll obviously help a lot. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? Yep. <laughs> well, you know what? That's a complicated answer.、Um, some of it does get to them. A lot of it goes to the nonprofits who want to help Haiti, 
Part of the problem with Haiti, just real quickly, the Red Cross got a ton of money from the United States and from other, other people and countries. But they are holding that money because they truly believe that, and, I, and, it, and to some degree it's, it's, it's correct, that they have to build homes for these people. They have to provide better shelters in these 10 cities. So they were holding a lot of that money to build the shelters. The problem with is there's no land for them to build on because Haiti basically is owned by about six really rich families that would not relinquish any land to build on for the people who are homeless. So they were, everybody was at an impasse. Um, they were holding the money to build for these people, but there's no place to build on. None of the families who own the money would give any of the land, or own the land, would give any of the, uh, the land to build on. So it, it was a very, and it is a very complicated situation. Plus, their government can't seem to get out of its way. So, anybody else? All right. Thank you guys very much. Um, Fa Facebook and Twitter, so I could be proud with my uh, show my ma my managers and I mentee, uh, ment mentor kids all the time. So if you guys need help, I'll give uh, the powers that be my email and you can email me. And if you want to show me some of your work or something like that, I'd be glad to see it. All right, thank you. Just real quickly, uh, the special events planning class would just like to thank David Ono for coming out. We truly appreciate it. I think that was a very heartfelt and insightful session. And as a small token of our appreciation, we'd love to give you this wonderful gift, ba gift basket that we put together for you. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you.